Welcome to my second video about the logic of scientific discovery. Last time I was talking about the logic of what we can know from experience. And a brief summary of that is that science is trying to prove strictly universal statements, scientific laws, natural laws, which are true in all times and all places. Problem is we can't prove them true because of the problem of induction that we talked about before, but we can prove them wrong. Well, where does that leave science? What I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to talk about the methodological rules which define science, as well as what separates science from non-science. Before I talk about this, I want to talk more broadly about the, the underlying idea behind Popper's philosophy. Now, Popper is most well known for two books. One of them is this one, The Logic of Scientific Discovery, and the other one is his book, The Open Society and Its Enemies. Now, this book is about the philosophy of science. Open Society and Its Enemies is a defense of liberal democracy against totalitarianism. So it's a book about the comparison of different political systems. Now, you might look at that and you might think, how are those two things in any way possibly related? And they're related because they are connected by the same underlying philosophical idea, Popper's underlying idea of critical rationalism. Critical rationalism just means we could be wrong and therefore we should question our ideas. What makes science so good, in Popper's opinion, is it is able to test and get rid of bad ideas. What is good about liberal democracy compared to totalitarianism is people are free to criticize and get rid of bad ideas. To go back to science, there are certainly day-to-day -day examples in which our intuitions are wrong. For example, it is the case that the Earth is going around the sun, moving at tremendous speed. However, it certainly doesn't feel like it. We still act as if the sun is rising and setting. We think that the Earth is stationary, even though it's actually moving. So, turns out that our intuition about being stationary is completely wrong. Here's another one. It turns out that it doesn't matter how much mass something has, how big the, the ball is, comparing a tennis ball to a cannonball. Well, they all fall at the same acceleration, hit the ground at the same time. Now, that's very counterintuitive because you'd think that heavier things fall faster. Turns out that intuitive ideas can be wrong and even scientists can be wrong. Newton and Galileo thought that time and space were things which were absolute. So time in terms of two things happen, is one thing happening before the other or are they simultaneous? Einstein found actually that's wrong. If you're going close to the speed of light, whether two things are simultaneous or one is before the other depends on where you're standing. And so there's certainly a lot of intuitive ideas and even scientific ideas that have turned out to be wrong. Okay, so what is the nature of science? Well, what science is trying to do is science is trying to find out things about the world and it finds out about the world using theories. And if you have a theory that grows your knowledge, so if you have a theory about the world that adds things and tells you things, that means that that theory has what Popper calls empirical content. Empirical content means the theory tells you things about the world. So here's an idea. I could say to you, my theory is that tomorrow it will or will not rain. That's my theory. It will or will not rain. It has no empirical content. I've exhausted all the options. There's no way to know if I was right or I was wrong. It doesn't say anything about the world. When you have a scientific theory, you make a claim about the world and that claim allows you to make predictions. And what the theory is really doing is it's splitting the world into things which the theory allows and things which the theory rules out. So let's imagine a big circle here and this circle represents all possible facts, all possible facts about the world, all things that could potentially be true. When you have a theory, you split the world into a small amount of things that the theory does allow and a larger amount which it doesn't. If I make the claim all swans are white, then in that smaller circle, it's allowing the existence of white swans, but it's not allowing the existence of black swans. So what does that mean? Well, that means 
that I can then test the theory by seeing if there is a black swan. And then if I see a black swan, the theory is proven wrong. So what that means is that if a theory has empirical content, if a theory says something about the world, then there is a way to prove the theory wrong. So science finds out about the world with theories which add knowledge, have empirical content, but it can only have empirical content if there are ways to prove it wrong. In fact, the more a theory says, the more ways there are to prove it wrong. So if I say that all swans are white and can fly, I've said two things, and so there are two ways to prove it wrong by seeing a swan which isn't white or a swan which can't fly. The more a theory says about the world, the more ways there are to prove it wrong. And so, because of this, the way Popper characterizes science is that science is defined by falsifiability. Now, the reason why that idea before, when I said maybe it will or will not rain tomorrow, that's not a scientific theory because there's no ways to prove it wrong. It doesn't say anything and therefore there's no way to prove it wrong. So something tells you about the world to the degree that there are ways to, to find out if it was wrong. So that's how Popper defines science. So here's an example of a theory which Popper says is unfalsifiable and therefore unscientific. One good example of an unfalsifiable theory is the personality theory of the psychologist Alfred Adler. Adler believed that most human behavior was explained by motivation toward power and authority. And as well as that, he believed that the motivation toward power and authority was unconscious, so you weren't even aware of it. If Adler asked me, Kieran, are you motivated by power and authority? And I say no, well, he'd say, ah, you are motivated by power and authority, but you don't realize it because it's unconscious. Now, let's imagine that Adler saw someone who was being very, uh, very nasty. Adler might say, ah, that person is being very nasty because that person is trying to inflict their will upon others because they want power and authority. However, if Adler saw someone who had been very nice and pro-social, then Adler would say, ah, that person is being nice to get more social connection so that other people will do their bidding because that person is motivated by power and authority. And so whatever you do, whether you're nice or you're nasty, Adler still thinks that you're motivated by power. Now, what that means is it's a theory, first of all, it's a theory that doesn't make any predictions. Because from this person is motivated by power, you can't predict whether the person will be nice or nasty. So it doesn't make predictions. But it also doesn't rule anything out about the world. Now, if Adler had said that motivation toward authority is associated with antisocial behavior, and he could measure people on both and plot a correlation between them, if he could find a measure of the thing, then there would be a way to prove it wrong. However, as it currently stands, his theory was unfalsifiable and therefore didn't say anything and therefore wasn't scientific. It's a bit like the statement, it maybe it will or will not rain tomorrow. A converse example of the theory which is falsifiable is uh, Galileo's laws of falling bodies. So Galileo was one of the physicists who discovered it doesn't matter how much mass something has, it all falls at the same rate. Now, what he did is he took cannonballs and he dropped them and he saw if they both hit the ground at the same rate. And he found, oh, they all, they both accelerate at the same rate. Now, that's actually something you can falsify because what that theory is doing is it's allowing the possibilities, they'll hit the ground at the same time. But if one hits the ground before the other, then the theory would be proven wrong. And so a theory is scientific if there are ways to prove it wrong. Popper is sometimes mischaracterized as thinking that scientists are about to abandon their theories at any moment. But that's not what Popper is doing. Because Popper, he's not naive. He understands that scientists are people too and people are flawed. And if I have been spending 30 years doing experiments based on a particular theory, giving speeches about my theory, getting a, a good job because of my theory, well, maybe I don't want to prove that theory wrong. Popper is not naive about this. He understands that 
scientists may often try to avoid falsifiability, might try to get around and avoid falsifiability in order to save their theories from being proven wrong. Now, this leads me to talk about a philosophy which Popper really disagrees with, which is the philosophy of conventionalism. This is how Popper defines conventionalism. Science begins with statements which it assumes to be true and then tries to explain the world with a small number of statements, basically trying to get the, the facts to twist and distort the facts in such a way that they match the theory. Popper proposes rules which characterize science. These rules he gives, they're not logical rules like we were talking about before, but these are methodological rules, kind of like the rules of a game, rules which prevent science from being unfalsifiable. So science is governed by rules which keep ideas falsifiable, which stop you from protecting an idea if it's wrong. So what we're going to imagine is that there's a scientist over there and this scientist over here, this scientist believes that all swans are white. And let's imagine we've seen a black swan. What the scientist might do over here is the scientist might come up with all these different tricks, what Popper calls conventionalist stratagems in order to protect the hypothesis all swans are white. So if I find a a black swan, the scientist might backtrack and say, oh, my hypothesis, all swans are white. I actually meant all swans are white, except the swans on this lake. So the scientist could just change the hypothesis after the fact. Now, Popper doesn't allow that. Popper says, you can get new hypotheses, but then you need to test them. You can't just add new hypotheses to explain away the fact that your theory has gone wrong. You can't just add a new hypothesis as an excuse and say, well, it might be explained by something else. What I could do, seeing the, the uh, black swan, the scientist might say, oh, actually, um, it is a white swan because we define white as including the color black. So the scientist might change the definition. And Popper says, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to change definitions. And if you do change definitions, you have to change the whole theoretical system of the science to match that new definition. So you're not allowed to change your definitions just to protect your precious hypotheses. Now the scientist over there might say, well, actually maybe it is really a white swan after all and we'll find out in future. Maybe future research will figure it out. Or maybe this scientist getting a bit desperate over here might just call me a liar. This scientist might just say, I've measured everything wrong and I'm an incompetent researcher and just insult me to try to discredit me in front of the other scientists. And Popper says, no, you're not allowed to do those things. Every time a decision is made, it must be made on the evidence. And that's that. And so these are the rules of science, which Popper says science does use and should use to make sure that if an idea is wrong, we get rid of it. The analogy that Popper uses is natural selection, the natural selection of ideas that what science does is it begins with a lot of ideas and then what we do is we subject them to tests, a struggle for survival, subject them to tests. And basically, science is the place where false ideas go extinct, where false theories go extinct. When Popper talks about falsifiability, he doesn't just mean that a theory is falsifiable or it isn't. There are also degrees of falsifiability. Some theories may be more falsifiable than others. Now, let's imagine that we have the theory all swans are white. Now, how would you prove that wrong? Well, you would prove that wrong with a black swan. However, a theory which applies to more things, which demands more of the world, is one way of saying it, would be more falsifiable, such as a theory that all birds are white, because they can prove it wrong, not just with black swans, but with black herons and black ravens. And what if the theory is more precise? Well, if the theory is more precise, it's more falsifiable. There's more ways to prove it wrong. So if I say not just that all birds are white, but all birds are a particular shade of eggshell white, then if I find a bird which is a slightly different shade, then I can prove it wrong. 
Now, that's the reason why science should have very precise measurements. For example, if I'm just using a very poor camera that can't really tell the difference between different shades, then there's a big range of different shades of white that I can't distinguish between. However, if I have a good camera that can tell the difference between a lot of different shades, I can take a look and say, ah, yes, that's not eggshell white, that's a different kind of white. And so the more uh, precise the measurement, the more falsifiable. The third way that theories differ in falsifiability is what Popper calls dimensionality, which is the amount of falsifying statements which the theory can withstand before being proven wrong. So basically, how many hoops you have to jump through before you prove a theory wrong. Let's imagine that this scientist over here has said all swans are white. I find a black swan, the theory's wrong. Dimensionality of zero. However, the scientist, making excuses, could say, well, that's not a black swan, it's just a white swan that's covered in oil. And then what I have to do is I have to get the black swan and then I have to wash it and find out if it is covered in oil. So now I have to do two things to prove the theory wrong. What I need to do is I need to prove that it's a white swan and it's not covered in oil. So that would be dimensionality of one because the theory can withstand one falsifying statement. Now the scientist over here then says, well, get your eyes tested. That is still a, a white swan. Obviously my eyes aren't working. So now I have to do three things. I have to find a black swan. I have to give it a wash and prove it's not covered in oil. And I have to go to the opticians to prove that my eyes are working. And so now that theory can withstand two falsifying statements. Popper's point here is that simpler theories are more falsifiable. The simpler a theory, the easier it is to prove it wrong. Conventionalists might say, oh, I like, a, I like this theory to be simple, a, a, an aesthetically pleasing, beautiful, simple equation. Popper says, no, there's a better reason why theory should be simple. It's because if a theory is simple, then there are fewer hoops you need to jump through in order to prove the theory wrong. If I say all swans are white, that's a simpler theory than saying all swans are white or they're covered in oil or I need to see the optician. That second theory is a lot longer because it's making excuses. Science doesn't make excuses. That what defines something as scientific, what defines something as scientific is that it tests claims against experience in such a way that if the theory was wrong, you'd know about it. And what the scientist should do, if you're a scientist, what you should do is you should try to find rules which are more universal, use more precise measures, and assume the fewest things so that you are maximally able to know if your theory is wrong. So far, we have talked about theories which are what are called deterministic, which is to say A equals B, F equals MA, one thing equals another. But a lot of the time that's not how scientific theories work. A lot of the time scientific theories are based on probability. So what I'm going to do next time is I'm going to ask, okay, how does science handle probability? Can Popper's theory handle randomness?